Hello and good morning. Hey, Ara, how are you? Fantastic. How about you, dude? I'm doing well. Nice to talk to you again. Dude, when, when you said that you were writing a book about Fleetwood Mac, I was expecting to talk to you in a year or so. I mean, I didn't realize that it was ready to rock right now. Well, no, no, no. I haven't written about one. I haven't written a book about him. I'm, I'm just talking about it. I just did kind of like a media, uh, just a, kind of a publicity thing to just draw attention to it. It's a, it's kind of an important date in their uh in their history and the two two major things happen so that's that's kind of what we're, what we're doing i love that because my last book what i did was as i as i wrote the chapters i went on to social media and i talked about it just so i could get people to you know to kind of go whoa i, I got to read this book when it's finally done yeah for sure it's utilizing the tools that are sitting right here in front of us scott absolutely it's a lot of them wow so what is your connection to fleetwood mac well, you know, I've been a big fan for for geez, as long as I can remember. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they've been they've been around longer than I have. Um, you know, and you know they 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 you know when I was doing my tour for the Mamas and the Papas book, um, you know, I got a lot of people telling me that uh, you know uh, comparing it to Daisy Jones and the Six, which was uh, you know based off of loosely kind of based off of Fleetwood Mac's story so you know the Fleetwood Mac uh, uh, the, the mamas and the papas were kind of the architect of the dysfunctional uh, married group or with, with or with love interests uh, in each other and Fleetwood Mac uh, kind of took it to a whole other level <laughs> I've been with Ken Collet, and he told me what it was like to be in the studio with Fleetwood Mac when when they were putting together rumors Oh, I bet you he has some pretty interesting stories to tell. Oh, I hope you reach out to him, dude, because, I mean, he is such a storyteller in the way of what it was like when things were not going so well. Right, and that was a tough time for him. You know, there was, uh, they just, I don't think they were even really talking to each other. There was just a lot of emotion, a lot of drama, a lot of hurt feelings. But, you know, I think they were able to put all that energy into that album, you know, and into the sessions and and the, the songs that they wrote and, Man, they gave us one of the greatest of all time. Yeah. Does it shock you that there are still people around that believe that Rumors was that overnight sensation? That, that here, who was this new band that was taking over? <laughs> and yet, as a fan, oh, hell no. The, I, I've been a Fleetwood Mac fan all the way back to Peter Green. Well, yeah, you know, I remember when I was a kid going to, uh, like, Woolworths and, <laughs> and stores where they sold cassettes and, and yeah. seeing, like, you know, the best of British blues volume seven. And, you know, you would see people on there like Graham Bond and long John Baldry yes. and then, and John Mayall. And you would see Fleetwood Mac. And I remember being like Fleetwood Mac, you know, <laughs> what are they doing on here? You know, but they were, you know, the, they, they started off as a, as a, a blues band, uh, you know, four guys. And then they added Danny Kerwin a little while later and they, they just, you know, played straight up Chicago blues for a couple of years. And, you know, then kind of moved into a, a more uh, FM rock sound yeah. uh, that uh, garnered them a little more interest. Oh, my God. You must have been looking at my notes because one of my questions is, do you think that FM radio? Oh, for sure. Yeah. You know, it was it was the right time. It was, um, you know, fl- uh, FM radio was kind of starting to move away from just album oriented rock stations yeah. where they played entire uh, sides of an album or the long version of light my fire or the end by the doors, you know, and, and to, to mimic more of the AM top 40 stations. And, uh, you know, so, but, you know, Fleetwood Mac was also played there too, back in the seventies. So, uh, you know, by the time the eighties came along and MTV and all that stuff, they were, they were right in there, man. They, they, they moved into that, uh, that arena swiftly. Wow. I miss those days when they would play the full albums because, I mean, and I've got Alexa now, and all I do is I say, Alexa, play The Elder from Kiss. I want to start it from the beginning all the way to the end, or Frampton Comes Alive, because I want to experience full albums again in my life. Yeah, yeah, they are. They, they, they It's kind of a lost art form. I, you know, and I don't know, I, I don't know what the current hit makers are like because I really don't listen to them. There, there are a lot of um, kind of... Uh, like a subgenre called retro soul and uh, mm-hmm. you know there's a lot of new young artists there and they, they really sound like a lot of the music from the 60s and the 70s and like mayor hawthorne and you know he puts out an album and it's great from start to finish you know so uh so there there are so there's good music out there good albums you just kind of have to look for it a little bit harder now how come we don't know the story of jeremy spencer he was kind of a uh, you know he, he was kind of a strange guy, you know. He was uh, he was one of the original members of Fleetwood Mac, yeah. a straight up blues guy. 
but he also liked uh, like 1950s music, like oh. rockabilly and Buddy Holly and stuff like that. You know, so he would he put out a solo album in 1970 while he was still a member with the Fleetwood Mac, and uh, it was it was kind of weird. It was kind of all over the place. And then uh, you know, I think after Peter Green left, he started to have a breakdown of his own. One, mm. one of the many members of Fleetwood Mac to have a breakdown, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and uh, he, they were in uh, Los Angeles getting ready to play the Whiskey a Go Go in 1971, and he said, "I'm going out to." Uh, to get a magazine and uh, went to a bookstore and never came back. And they found him a couple of days later in a, in a religious cult called the children of God, where he, where he stayed. And, you know, he put out an album with them. And then um, a couple of years later, after uh, Buckingham Nix joined Fleetwood Mac, he put out an album called flea by the Jeremy Spencer band. And, and he was, he was a good imitator and he uh, really kind of imitated the sound of Fleetwood Mac with uh, Stevie and Lindsay. And there's kind of an interesting album. Well, you're going to think I'm a freak, but as a kid in Billings, Montana, I promised myself to never see Fleetwood Mac in concert because I want, I never wanted to lose that feeling of discovering them. And the thing is, is that just a couple of weeks ago, I watched my first concert thanks to uh, streaming television and I was blown away by it. I, I, I've robbed my childhood of, of something that was so special. <laughs> Yeah, that wasn't a good move, man. You should have done it. I, <laughs> I, uh, I saw them live, uh, I guess, back in 2014 when uh, Christine McVie rejoined them because I didn't want to see them without her. You yeah. know, they had been they had been touring for a number of years, just the four of them, and she had retired. But uh, she came out of retirement uh, for for a number of years there with them and, and toured, and it was great. I saw them in Philadelphia, and uh, it was. You know, to see Lindsey Buckingham just shred that guitar, and oh I'm so afraid. You know, it was uh, it was incredible. Oh. You know, I'll tell you, one of the greatest albums that I have heard from from any member of Fleetwood Mac was the last one from Lindsey, where he worked side by side with Christine. To this day, I can't get enough of her final moments. Yeah, that's a great album. I I, I got to see that. Uh, I got to see them live too. The Buckingham wow. McVie tour. I got them to see them in New York City at the Beacon Theater, and they put on a really really great show. And uh, yeah, it was it was an interesting combination. But then you know, like you know, they they rejoined Fleetwood Mac, and then a couple of years later, uh, Lindsay gets fired like permanently. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's just a lot of strife in that group. Yeah, I think it emanates from Stevie Nicks and Lindsey Buckingham's relationship. Yeah, but see, that's what I loved about watching them in concert was the fact that you could see it when they would look at each other while, while singing the vocals and trying to harmonize. And it's like, oh, you guys are still fighting. Ah, God love you. God <laughs> love you. <laughs> I know. I know. It's crazy. Still carrying that, still carrying that torch on to some level. <laughs> so what did what did Mick Fleetwood see in Lindsey and, and Stevie? Was, was it the songwriting or was it, oh my God, here is the this beautiful woman, I can market this. Well, he went to, uh, you know, they, they were on the verge of breaking up yep. uh, in 1973 and 74. Uh, they, they had a really tough year in 73 with, uh, they had a guy named Bob Weston who was uh, on guitar and he ended up having an affair with Nick Fleetwood's wife and uh, that, that broke him up. And then there was this whole fake Fleetwood Mac they sent out because the tour got canceled. That's a whole other story. But needless to say, after the dust settled, uh, Bob Welch, who was the guitarist, he didn't the main guitarist. He didn't want to be part of it anymore. He was getting ready to leave. So Mick Fleetwood was looking for a place to record their next album in Los Angeles, and he went to this studio. and The engineer uh, played him an example of a song that was recorded there. It was off the Buckingham Mix album. It was called Frozen Love, and he was just blown away by Lindsay's playing. And I think Lindsay was either around the premises there or on the premises, and they. And they and he introduced them to Mick, and, and you know Mick was just uh, just blown away by him, and he invited asked him to come join the band. And he said, uh, "I'll only do it if Stevie, uh, my oh. girlfriend, can, can join." And uh, you know he really wanted uh, Lindsay, so he he said yes, and and you know that was a, a gamble that really paid off because uh, that 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 investment came back to, you know a hundredfold for him the top two lists of my favorite Fleetwood Mac songs, The Chain and Tusk. But yet when I say Tusk, people go, oh, come on. Why <laughs> Why didn't people fall in love with that song? Or even that whole album? It may be uh, uh, the, the horns are just a little bit too much. Oh, I don't know. Oh, that's <laughs> what I love. When it, when it kicks in toward the end, holy crap, I live for that moment, even know, to this day. My brother's a big fan of that song. He always, I remember we, when we were kids, MTV would always play that video of them playing it with the USC marching band. And, <laughs> and he, he would, he would always get excited about that one. I'm, I'm more of a, 
a gypsy, uh, yeah. you know, uh, I love Tango in the Night. That's such a great album, and I can listen to that uh, from start to finish at wow. any time. Wow. So when it comes to Fleetwood Mac, I mean, there, there's such a, a beautiful story there, and yet it's a reckless story, and yet you've got Stevie Nicks, who's in the Hall of Fame twice. There had, see, there's a diamond in every every rough piece of stone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there is, you know, and, and, and she's one of those exclusive uh, members that's in, you know, in, in there for two, like Neil Young. I think he's in there for two. He's in there for three and his wow. solo stuff, Buffalo Springfield and Crosby, Stills and Nash and Young. And, um, you know, so uh, she's she's part of an exclusive club. But, uh, you know, it's and it's funny because she doesn't have the strongest voice in the world, but it's it's very enticing and people love it. I love it. And uh, she never really overextends it and she hasn't really lost it either it's uh it's it's still still kind of there uh you know definitely not as you know as you get older it's not going to be as strong as it was when you were younger but you know the way her style she can she can uh, live up to it uh, when she has to you know led zeppelin was known for their their mystique i think fleetwood mac has that as well because at one point in time all we had were album covers and pictures yeah for sure you know i heard stevie nicks say that too because when she um I saw an interview with her one time where she was talking about uh, when she joined the band, she didn't really know much about them. They weren't really big here in, in the United States and, and, and their, their popularity in England had really waned. Uh, and so she went back to their back catalog and, and listened from start to finish up to the point, you know, to, to the last album, Heroes Are Hard to Find, before they joined. And she said that same thing. There was just this overarching mysticism, you know, it kind of came from Peter Green and Bob Welch's guitar playing and, oh God, and the, 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 some of the song lyrics and stuff like that. And, and she and, and Lindsay really kind of picked up the torch and kept that going. I totally forgot that Bob Welch was part of that. I remember when I first found out that Bob was part of it, and it was because of Casey Kasem, that, because Bob Welch had a song on his own. He goes, former Fleetwood Macker, Bob Welch. I'm going, what the hell are you talking about, Casey? <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of mysteries to that group that you discover. In fact, that his big hit "Sentimental Lady" was originally yes. co- recorded uh, on the Fleetwood Mac uh, "Bare Trees" album. So, he uh, the, the version uh, we hear is a re-recording from 1977. That was his big hit version. Wow! Don't you love the fact that Stevie Nicks has embraced Miley Cyrus? I mean, the interview that I heard with Miley was that Stevie talked to her about having an alto voice and how to work that alto voice. And now we've got you know flowers from Miley Cyrus, and I'm thinking Stevie Nicks. Has had to have something to do with that because you've become this giant legend in your own time. Yeah, she's very talented, and she, I've heard a few songs of hers, you know, that I that are really good. And I actually, I even saw her and uh, Jimmy Fallon uh, doing a, a takeoff of Dolly Parton and Kenny Rogers doing <laughs> "Islands in the Stream," and they sang it really well, you know. I was, and, but and they they both dressed the part too, and uh, you know, and she she nailed it, man. She's a she's a great singer, and uh, she does have a good voice. So, how when you put this book together, are you going to reach out to the members of the band, or how are you going to do? things uh yeah i I mean if if i ever get around to that one i i I for sure will but time is you know we're running out of time (laughs) you know i'm getting to the point where the people i have uh, i I have to write about are are passing away even when i wrote the mamas and the papas book you know three of the four of them uh had died already and and, uh i was a nobody from nowhere with no literary agent or publisher and uh, you know reaching out to michelle phillips I, i even though i tried was was an impossibility but you know she put out a book on her own um about a, a, a autobiography in, in the 80s that told her side of the story and that was a big help so if i if i get around to doing that fleetwood mac one I'm, i imagine i would have to do it the same way you and i are on the same page because my wife and i were just having a conversation yesterday about ozzy osbourne as well as rod stewart both of them are not well and i and i just keep going please let me have one more conversation please 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 <laughs> i just i because because i swear to god that uh, uh, scott that you and i are historians in the way of music yeah and you know i mean look they're still writing books about beethoven and bach and (laughs) and the the roman empire and the catholic church and its history so you know there's this is a an era and we have a lot more at our disposal you know a lot of those people they only have you know if you want to write about the civil war you have to go out and study old manuscripts and (laughs) and scrolls and writings you know we at least have uh, you know books and uh, mass media to, to to help us out would you say that Fleetwood Mac is a great representative of of perseverance or incredible marketing? 
Uh, I think there, you know, I think it's it's both. Obviously, there's perseverance because uh, there was many times, uh, especially in those early years, where that group could have just folded. But you know, thankfully, with uh, Mick Fleetwood and, and John McVie, they didn't, and they they kept on going because those are the only two that have been there from start to finish. Go figure. Fleetwood and Mac are the the two stalwarts of that group. Um, and, uh, it's, uh, I, I think that's, that's really lent itself to their, to their endurance. And, you know, they, they picked up some really talented people along the way and they always seem as, even though it's, they, they, they fight, it's, they always seem to get back together again, but, you know, we lost Christine McVie last year, yeah. so there, there won't be a full reunion of the classic lineup ever again. Okay. You just said something that all my years of Fleetwood Mac, I've never heard before. You said Fleetwood and Mac. Are we talking John McVie being the Mac? Yeah, yeah. Are you kidding me? I had no idea, dude. Oh my yeah. god. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, you know that was uh, and it's funny because Peter Green named them that um, in hopes that John McVie would join them because Peter and uh, John McVie were both and Mick Fleetwood were all in um, John Mayo's Blues Breakers and Mick Fleetwood ended up getting fired and Peter Green left to form his band and he wanted he wanted uh, John McVie to join him because he liked the way he and Mick sounded together. And uh, so he named the group Fleetwood Mac in, in hopes that it would uh, kind of cajole him. And it didn't at first. Uh, John McVie was, uh, he was happy where he was, but then John Mayo started bringing in horns and wanted to go kind of in a jazzy direction. And, and John was like, okay, I think I'll go join Peter and Mick. And, and the, the Mac finally did join Fleetwood Mac. And yep, it does stand for McVeigh. And then they did Tusk. I can't imagine what he went through. Oh my God. Yeah, right. Really? What, so what about us crazy old radio people that always got on there to talk on a, on a song intro and said, Eric Clapton was once a member of Fleetwood Mac. Is that true? <laughs> Uh, no, Eric Clapton was never a member of Fleetwood. God, I lied to people so many times. He was a member. He was a member of uh, John Mayo's Blues Breakers, okay. and Peter Peter Green uh, replaced him. Okay. So. Yeah, because there's there's a I think it's called the Green List that has all the bands that are related, and so we all we saw Eric Clapton on there associated with Fleetwood Mac. So now I understand that he was in a different part of the rooting system. Yeah, yeah, he kind of, he helped lay the groundwork because if he if he had not left, Peter Green would not have joined, and uh, we would never have Fleetwood Mac. All right, another moment that I would get on the air and I would talk about, and you're going to know more about this. I swear, I read in in Mick Fleetwood's book that he can't play the same drum beat twice. That he is very di- he's difficult on himself. Is that true? Does he have a learning a, a disability there? Well, he's he's never been like fully trained. Like he's oh. not a trained drummer. He just kind of taught himself, and he has a weird crazy style that just uh, like you know i think also in that book he also said that that you know people would study him and they couldn't duplicate it because he's just kind of all over this all over the place it's kind of like van morrison like van morrison never sings the the same song the same way twice you know (laughs) so i challenge you to create a podcast and as you go through this journey give us little niblets of of what you're doing what you experience your oh wow moments and things that we can have so that when the book comes out we're gonna go holy crap it's finally here (laughs) yeah there you go i do want to do a podcast i just I, i I just got to build up my build up my audience a little bit before I do that. Wow, wow! You, you promise me you're going to come back when this book is released? Absolutely. All right, dude. You're you're always filled with so much love for music. I love that about you. <laughs> yeah, I do. It's 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 been with me all my life, man. I I, I love it. Like it drives my wife crazy. I think, <laughs> but uh, you know, because <laughs> she thinks that she thinks the music is the other woman. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, please come back and you be brilliant today, okay? Thanks, Arrow.